there was one word that could describe the 2000 NFL season, it would be incomparable. The Baltimore Ravens crushed the New York Giants 34 to 7 to win the Super Bowl. Peyton Manning threw for over 4,400 yards, and the New England Patriots signed a legend we all know would go on to terrorize almost every single NFL franchise throughout the 2000s and 2010s. But before the season even started, we had the NFL Draft, an event that teams look forward to each year in hopes of signing a big name that could potentially change their team's course of direction for the next 10 or so seasons. Normally, these videos would start off by talking about a first round pick that would turn into a future Hall of Famer, but today we start with round six, pick number 199. This is the exact opposite of the norm because the later round draft picks usually don't amount to too much, but the Patriots would find a diamond in the rough here. Looking back at the Patriots season in 1999, it was average to say the least. They finished with a 500 record of 8-8, eight and eight, and their starting quarterback Drew Bledsoe was coming off a season where he threw 19 touchdowns and 21 interceptions. It was clear that the Pats needed a change, so they decided to move on from head coach Pete Carroll and go with Bill Belichick. To start off the draft, they selected four straight offensive players, but no quarterbacks. They must not have liked what they saw on the board at the time, but once their second six-round pick came up, they took their chance. A kid from Michigan named Tom Brady. As we know now, Tom Brady would be one of, if not the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. But if we take a step back to his first season in the league, it would take him a little while to get his chance. Throughout the 2000 season, Brady only attempted three passes and completed one for just six yards. But in week two of the 2001 season, Patriots then starter Drew Bledsoe was scrambling up the sideline late in the fourth quarter and got demolished by Mo Lewis. So third down and 10 now, a big play for the Patriots. Bledsoe, gonna run it, needs 10 yards. Oh, does he hit? Oh my. Following the hit, Bledsoe was ruled out indefinitely for the upcoming weeks, and the Patriots were ranked dead last in week three with almost nobody believing they could beat the Peyton Manning-led Colts. Sure enough, Tom Brady proved all the doubters wrong in his first start. It wasn't an amazing game stat-wise for Brady as he didn't throw for any touchdowns, but he didn't need to because the run game was absolutely cooking and the defense was doing more than their part. They scored three touchdowns on the ground, had two pick sixes, and ended up destroying the Colts 44 to 13. Brady didn't look back after this point in time, leading the Patriots to an 11-5 record, which was tied for first in the division and ultimately led them to the Super Bowl against Kurt Warner and the St. Louis Rams. Patriots jumped out to a 17-3 lead heading into the fourth quarter, but the Rams would quickly come back to tie the game with only a minute 30 left to play. This all set up a potential game-winning drive by Brady, and it all came down to Adam Vinatieri. The rest is honestly history after this season. Brady would go on to win five more Super Bowls, 13 more Pro Bowls, and three Super Bowl MVPs with the Patriots before eventually parting ways with New England after the 2019 season. The Buccaneers wasted no time scooping him up after he left, knowing that he still had a lot more in the tank left to offer, and they were definitely right because he led them to a Super Bowl in his first year with the team. They found themselves matched up against the Chiefs, who had finished the year with a record of 14-2 in the regular season. Not many people thought the Bucs had any chance of winning this game, but they will tell you one thing now. Never count out Tom Brady. The Bucs would go on to absolutely demolish the Chiefs 31-9. Brady would throw for three touchdowns and walk away with yet another Super Super Bowl MVP under his belt. After the 2022 season, it was clear Brady's age was finally starting to catch up with him, and he decided to call it a career, winning a total of seven Super Bowls, five Super Bowl MVPs, making 15 Pro Bowl appearances, along with countless records such as most quarterback wins, most regular season and postseason quarterback wins, most Super Bowl MVPs, only Super Bowl MVP for two different franchises most Pro Bowl selections, and the first unanimous NFL MVP. After retiring, Tom Brady has been doing more than I can even mention here. He has stake in the Birmingham City Football Club, has minority stake in the Raiders, signed a 10-year contract with Fox Sports to be an analyst, and apparently, now he works at Delta. Honestly, at this point in time, what isn't Tom Brady doing? Oh, <laughs> Nolan, put your sunscreen on.
Some quick honorable mentions that I wanted to throw in here at the quarterback position from the 2000 draft was Mark Bolger, who was a two-time pro bowler for the St. Louis Rams, and Chad Pennington, who had spent time with the Jets and Dolphins and threw for over 17,000 yards throughout his 11-year career. Next, we're going to jump all the way back to pick number five, where the Ravens would take one of, if not the best running backs that this class had to offer in Jamal Lewis. They were fresh off an 8-8 eight eight season where their running backs didn't necessarily play too well. They had Priest Holmes who would go on to be a great running back for the Chiefs later in his career, but this year on the Ravens, he just couldn't escape injuries and only had 506 rushing yards. I will say he did average 6 yards a touch, so Holmes was indeed the real deal, and the Chiefs were smart to see that later on in his career. The Ravens' other running back in 99 was Eric Brett, who started in 10 games and finished with 852 rushing yards, averaging 3.9 nine yards per touch. It was pretty clear that the Ravens wanted a change and they loved what they saw out of Jamal Lewis from Tennessee. He was a tough runner standing in at six foot and 240 pounds and Lewis had no problem going right through you if he needed to. Right from the jump it was very clear that Baltimore made the right choice selecting him. His first season in the league Lewis played in all 16 games and totaled 1,364 yards on the ground along with six touchdowns to go along with it. He was also thrusted into the biggest stage of them all in the playoffs of his first year in the NFL. The Ravens made it all the way to the Super Bowl against the New York Giants. Baltimore pulled out to an early lead in this game, which would pave the way for Lewis to carry the ball 27 times for 102 yards and add a touchdown to top it all off. They would easily win this game 34-7, making Lewis's first season in the league a huge success. Unfortunately, after putting up those amazing stats and winning a Super Bowl in his rookie season, Lewis would tear his ACL during the following summer, resulting in him missing the entire 2001 season. While some players never returned to the caliber of player they were before a knee injury like that, this was certainly not the case for Lewis. He came back roaring the very next year with over 1,300 yards on the ground and then would take a huge jump in the 2003 season, finishing with 2,066 rushing yards which led the league along with 14 touchdowns. 40 more yards and Lewis would have had the all-time single season rushing record, which is held by Eric Dickerson at 2,105 yards. This insane season would lead to him making his only Pro Bowl appearance as well as an All-Pro appearance. After his dominant 2003 season, Lewis was still a good running back for the Ravens, but wouldn't quite return to that caliber of player throughout his three following years with the team. In 2007, Lewis found himself on the Cleveland Browns, putting together two good years of over thousand rushing yards. Sadly, during the 2009 season, he would receive a concussion that was so bad it would ultimately end his career. It's estimated that throughout his career, Lewis suffered upwards of 10 concussions, which still negatively affects his mental health to this day. This poor guy also had to sell one of his Super Bowl rings in 2015 because of financial troubles that he was going through at the time. To clarify, he was gifted a ring when the Ravens won the Super Bowl in the 2012 season by the owner, Stephen Bishotti. After retiring from the NFL, Lewis has moved on to becoming the president and owner of Buyer Connected Inc., which is tied to the real estate industry. With one running back on our list down, we take a trip to pick number 19, where the Seattle Seahawks were on the clock looking for a young running back to back up Ricky Waters, who was getting up there in age about to turn 31 years old. Waters was a very good running back for Seattle, running for over a thousand yards in the previous two seasons, very underrated. But a backup plan is never a bad idea, and picking up Sean Alexander out of Alabama turned out to be a great investment. The first year of Alexander's career would be spent backing up Waters, but that was fine because it gave him some time to adjust to the game at the NFL level and get his feet wet. Once the 2001 season rolled around, he was ready to take that huge sophomore season leap. He would run for over 1,300 yards and finish with 14 touchdowns, which was the most in the entire league. After having another solid year in 2002, everything clicked and Alexander entered another gear, making the Pro Bowl in three straight seasons and leading the league in attempts, rushing yards, and touchdowns in the 2005 season. Get this, he had 28 total touchdowns that year and averaged 117 and a half yards per game, which was easily enough to earn him the MVP and Offensive Player of the Year awards. Along with those achievements in 2005, the Seahawks also made the Super Bowl against the Steelers. Unfortunately, they couldn't come away with a win, but Alexander did his part running for 95 yards on 20 carries. After that monster year with Alexander at the age of 29, he would begin to fall off pretty hard, not surpassing a thousand yards 
yards again throughout his two more seasons with the team. In 2008, he found himself on the Washington Redskins, but would only see 11 attempts all season long. Even though it would be a sour ending to his career, Alexander still had a great journey throughout the NFL, and of course, I can't finish off this section without mentioning the legendary Madden 07 cover with him on it. Honestly, it was up there for the best Madden of all time in my opinion. I used to play it all day when I was a kid. Since retiring, Alexander has returned to Seattle and has launched a family-focused media platform called Amazing Grace Families in order to provide resourceful content for families. Now we're going to shift our focus to the last running back on this list, who was taken by the Cardinals at pick number seven. Now Arizona was coming off a lackluster season, only putting together six wins, and the running back room was, to say the least, atrocious. In fact, no running back on the team had more than 600 yards in the 99 season. They were hoping that Thomas Jones would answer their prayers and provide a ground game they desperately needed. Unfortunately, that would not be the case. In three seasons with the Cardinals, Jones would not be the rushing leader in any of them. And apparently, he was at home in 2002. When he went to reach for the telephone, he ended up breaking his hand on the countertop, which kept him out for half the season. After that year, he would bounce from the Bucks and then to the Bears, where his career would finally start to take off. While in Chicago, Jones saw his rushing numbers rise drastically compared to when he was in Arizona. He finished two out of the three seasons over 1,000 yards with the Bears before being traded to the Jets prior to the 2007 season. Once he got to New York, he continued his run of dominance, reaching the 1,000-yard mark in all three of his years with the team, and even finding himself as a Pro Bowl selection in 2008, where he ran for 1,312 yards and had 15 total touchdowns. Following his Pro Bowl season, Jones put together one more great year, ending with over 1,400 rushing yards, but then things slowly started to wind down for him. 2010, he would find himself on the Kansas City Chiefs, where he would finish out the remaining 32 games of his career. Jones retired from the NFL at the age of 33, with one Pro Bowl appearance to his name and a lengthy career, especially for an NFL running back. After taking a step back from the league, Jones pursued another passion of his, which is producing and appearing in films such as Straight Outta Compton, as well as TV shows like Luke Cage and Being Mary Jane. From one skill position to another, now I want to jump to round three, pick number 78, where the Jets would be looking to snatch up a wide receiver worthy of filling the shoes of Keyshawn Johnson, who had just finished the past two seasons with over a thousand receiving yards and making the Pro Bowl in both of those years as well. Johnson was traded before the 2000 season began, and the next best receiver on the team was Wayne Krebet at the time. The Jets liked what they saw out of Lavernius Coles, though, and decided to take a chance on him coming out of Florida State. It wouldn't be a quick start for Coles, though, as it took him a season to get used to life in the NFL, but in the 2001 season, you could tell this kid had some real potential to be a great wide receiver in the league after totaling 868 yards on 59 catches and scoring seven touchdowns, which ended up leading the team. It seemed like he was really starting to hit his stride in the following season after reaching the 1,000-yard mark for the first time in his career, but he would then be traded to the Washington Redskins in the offseason. That first year in Washington would be his only one making the Pro Bowl, finishing the season with 1,204 receiving yards and six touchdowns. Apparently in 2005, Cole just didn't get enough of that New York lifestyle and found himself back in the Big Apple, even though I know the New York Jets and New York Giants don't actually play in New York. The Redskins ended up trading Coles for Santana Moss in a deal that would go on to seemingly benefit both teams in the long run, which was good. When he returned to the Jets, Coles went on to resume his role of leading wide receiver up until late in the 2007 season, where he would unfortunately have to go on to IR due to an ankle injury. Coles would spend one more year with the Jets before ending up in Cincinnati on the Bengals, where he finished out the season before retiring with one Pro Bowl appearance to his name. After retiring from the league, Coles has been enjoying retirement in Jacksonville, Florida, and his four children. One of them is carrying on the football tradition and is a running back for UCF. Your next question might be, well, who are some of the other wide receivers in this draft? And to answer that question, we have to jump back to pick number eight with the Pittsburgh Steelers on the clock. The Steelers were just coming off a season in which they finished 6-10, and 10, and their leading receiver only had 700 yards on the whole year. Plaxico Burris was the name that was announced at the podium, and it looked as if he would be a great complement to the developing Heinz Ward, who was another receiver on the Steelers at the time. Burris was a big body at 6'5", who could win jump balls, while Ward was shorter and just a little bit faster. The problem in the 2000 season wasn't the receivers, it was actually the quarterback play that was sort of letting the team down. But those issues weren't as glaring at some other teams in the league because Pittsburgh had one of the best defenses that year, holding teams to just under 16 points per game. 
Throughout the next few years with the team, Cordell Stewart and Tommy Maddox would do enough to put Burris on the map, exceeding 1,000 yards receiving in two out of three seasons, and Ward would go on to become a three-time Pro Bowler during this stretch of his career. 2004, Ben Roethlisberger would join the team, leading them to a 15-1 record. Unfortunately, they wouldn't be able to follow through and win the Super Bowl, losing to Tom Brady, the Patriots, in the AFC Championship game. After the season was over, Burris would move on from the Steelers and join the New York Giants, where he would spend the next four years of his career. While in New York, Burris was a great number one option for Eli Manning, steadily finishing with around 1,000 receiving yards every year. In 2007, the Giants would end up making it all the way to the Super Bowl and facing off against none other than Tom Brady and the Patriots. The score was closed the entire game, and with just under a minute left to play, the Giants found themselves down by four, just inside the 14-yard line. From the highest highs to the lowest lows, 2008 would spell disaster for Burris's career. Former Super Bowl champion Plexico Burris was formally indicted on gun charges Monday in New York City. On November 28th, he was at a nightclub LQ on Lexington Avenue in New York City. Burris would have a gun on him. The gun began sliding down his leg and when he went to grab it, he accidentally pulled the trigger hitting himself in the thigh. He later said in an interview that the gun had no safety on it. Now, after all this, Burris was forced to miss the next two seasons because of dealing with jail time due to that court case, and the Giants would release him after the 2008 season concluded. Once he could finally return to football, the Jets and Steelers would take a chance on him, but neither led to long-term success as he was already around 35 years old at the time. Honestly, when you think of Burris, you're always going to think of that night in the club, but he was much more than that, finishing as a one-time Super Bowl champion and an essential part of that Giants team for many years. Once he retired from the NFL, Burris went on to create a luxurious sock company, spent time as a coaching intern for the Cardinals, went back to school at Michigan State to get his bachelor's degree in communications, and has been a co-host of Up On Game on Fox Sports Radio. I also want to give a shout out here to Daryl Jackson, who is another wide receiver taking just two picks behind Lavernius Coles, but he doesn't get the same respect as Coles and Plaxico Burris gets, I feel like. Jackson spent seven seasons with the Seahawks before bouncing to the 49ers and then finally the Broncos. He was a very reliable wide receiver and finished his career with over 7,000 yards and 51 touchdowns. Now you know we just couldn't talk about all these offensive players without throwing in the top tight end from this draft class, who would end up being taken by the Packers with the 14th overall pick. Coming off an 8-8 eight eight season, Green Bay was definitely in need of a good tight end. In that 1999 season, the top tight end for them was Tyrone Davis, who would finish the year with only 204 total receiving yards. Packers decided to go with Bubba Franks, and once he joined the team, he immediately took over as the number one tight end, easily passing that 200-yard mark almost every single year with the team. But the reason he was so important to the team's success was because of his elite run blocking. There was a stretch of time from 2001 to 2003 where Franks made the Pro Bowl three consecutive seasons and was a huge help to the Packers winning 10 plus games each year. After his hot stretch came to an end, Franks was still a very reliable tight end for the team when healthy, but began missing more and more time due to injuries. Once the Packers realized it wasn't working out, they would send him to the New York Jets in 2008, where he would finish off his career. Franks retired with three Pro Bowl appearances to his name and is loved by many Packers fans for his efforts in the early 2000s. Honestly, I could barely find any information on what he's doing after retirement, except you can actually book him to speak at certain events if you'd really like to. They have him listed down on the website for meet and greets, endorsements, virtual events, but I'm sure if you really wanted Bubba Franks to talk in your kid's fifth birthday party, you can make it happen. Just reach out to him and after you do, Make sure to let me know what he's been up to so I can, of course, update this video. And don't you guys worry, I can't forget about the big men up front who need some love too. It may not be the most luxurious position to play in football, but the offensive line doesn't get nearly enough credit for how much they can control the game. Got a shout out a center here, Brad Meester, who played 14 seasons with the Jaguars and started in 209 games, and also Cooper Carlisle, who played 13 seasons with the Broncos and the Raiders. I'm actually mad because I was doing my research on these guys and found that Carlisle scored one six-yard touchdown. And boy, that would have been nice to put in this video, but there is no footage of this anywhere to be found on the entire internet. Unbelievable. The only catch of his entire career, you can't even find it. Absolutely pathetic. I am disgusted. 
Anyways, we got to stick to the trend here and mention two more big men from the 2000 class. First is Corey Simon, who was a defensive tackle taken six by the Philadelphia Eagles. He was actually the only player at this position from the draft to make a Pro Bowl appearance. Secondly, Chris Samuels, who was taken third by the Washington Redskins. He turned into an amazing run and pass blocker and would go on to make six Pro Bowl appearances. All right, it's time. I know you guys are waiting for it. Tom Brady was the most popular name on this draft list, of course, but there's a defensive player that would go on to dominate the league, and he was the life of the Chicago Bears defense for 13 years. He's also the only player currently from this class that's in the Hall of Fame right now. Have to say that because, of course, Tom Brady will be in there, no doubt one day in the future, but we're talking about Brian Erlacher. He was taken ninth overall and changed the entire dynamic of this defense. Chicago had multiple years throughout his time with the team where they finished inside the top five for points allowed. Erlacher came out of New Mexico with abilities that almost looked too good to be true according to defensive coordinator Greg Blatch. It's hard to believe this now that we know how his career turned out, but Erlacher was actually benched to start his rookie season. Once he figured out how to execute though, Erlacher was unstoppable and made the Pro Bowl six out of his first seven seasons in the league, along with winning Defensive Rookie of the Year. In 2002, he led the league in solo tackles with 117. Unfortunately, this was because the Bears couldn't put up many points on offense and defense was on the field a lot more that year. Nonetheless, it was very impressive, but the Bears finished the season 4-12, and so you can bet he wasn't too happy about that. Now, everything was going smooth up until 2004 when Erlacher would be put on IR, ending his season early due to a hamstring injury, but he would get back on track in 2005, winning Defensive Player of the Year and making back-to-back -back Pro Bowls. Throughout the rest of his career, Erlacher would make two more Pro Bowls in the 2010 and 11 seasons, but sadly the Bears could never put all the pieces together to win a Super Bowl while he was on the team. They did, however, make it all the way there in 2006, but lost to Peyton Manning and the Colts, 29-17. He retired with eight total Pro Bowl selections, four All-Pro selections, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2018. Since then, Erlacher has been spending a lot more time with his family in Arizona and loves watching his son play high school football. Also, in 2023, I just found this interesting, he ended up suing a Houston hair transplant company for claiming he used the product, and he never even did. They promoted it like he was using it and he loved the product. It was obviously based on a false narrative, using his image to gain business. Listen, he looks fine. The man does not need a hair transplant, even though he did kind of look like Johnny Sins, or maybe, maybe I'm seeing more Kurt Angle when he was bald in the league. I don't know. Now, since we don't have all the time in the world, I do want to give a quick mention to two other amazing linebackers from this draft class, LeVar Arrington and Julian Peterson. Arrington played seven years in the league for the Redskins and the Giants and made three Pro Bowl appearances, while Peterson played 11 years, made five Pro Bowls, and one All-Pro appearance for the Niners, Seahawks, and Lions. On the clock with back-to-back -back picks, we had the New York Jets in the first round, selecting two defensive ends consecutively. This was a bold move, of course, they were probably hoping both of them were turn out great, but they also probably thought they were hedging their bets a bit in case one of the two didn't end up working out. At least they would have one good player to work with. Well, it turns out both Sean Ellis and John Abraham would be solid at the position, and the Jets would get the best of both worlds. Ellis would spend 11 years with the Jets making two Pro Bowls before finishing off his career in New England, while Abraham would dominate for not only the Jets, but also the Falcons and the Cardinals making five Pro Bowls and two All-Pro appearances. And to end it all off, we have to give the Raiders credit for not only taking the best kicker in the draft, but also the best punter too. Sebastian Janikowski taken at pick number 17 and Shane Leckler taken at pick 142 would end up being an elite special teams combo. Janikowski, or Seabass as they call him, was built like an absolute truck. I mean, this was a big kicker who had one of the most powerful legs in the entire league. There was a game where Oakland let him attempt a 76-yard field goal. Of course, he didn't end up making it, but even having the confidence to let him try that was unbelievable. It would have beaten today's record by 10 whole yards. Shout out Justin Tucker, by the way, the absolute goat of kicking. But in his lone Pro Bowl season, Janikowski tied the NFL record at the time with a 63-yard field goal against the Broncos. 63-yard field goal attempt, which would match the longest in NFL history. From 63, kicks on the way. It is good. He got it. He was also very reliable throughout his 18 years in the league, retiring with a percentage of 80.4%. Of course, this might not have been possible without one of the best punters ever in Shane Leckler. For everything to go smoothly on Janikowski's end, 
Leckler had to do his job perfectly every single time. Aside from being a good holder, he was also pretty decent at punting too, I would say, making the Pro Bowl seven times and the All-Pro team six times. Leckler also led the league in yards per punt five seasons in his time with Oakland and is the NFL's all-time leader in career punting average, including a punt in 2011 that went for 80 yards, which was the longest of his entire career. After 13 years in Oakland, Leckler would find himself a new home in Houston, where he would finish off the last five years of his career. And what better way to end his career off than by leading the league in punting yards in his final season? And if we go back to Janikowski now for a second, after retiring, he's been focusing more on spending time with his wife and three children. He's just gonna let the future unfold how it's meant to be. He's chilling right now. Also in 2019, he was inducted into the Sea Breeze High School Hall of Fame, which was also pretty cool. As for Leckler, he also isn't too sure what his future holds in retirement, but he's a shoe in for making the Hall of Fame one day, which is a huge accomplishment. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to, as always, hit that subscribe button, drop a like on this video, and we will be coming at you with more very shortly. Have a great day.